Okay, in the uh, previous class, we completed our discussion of uh, flow with heat addition. Uh, we looked at situations where the heat added was less than uh, Q star, which was the amount of heat required to take the uh, inlet state to a sonic state for both supersonic and subsonic cases. What we are going to do next is to uh, work out an illustrated example to uh, see how the actual calculations can be carried out. That is what we are going to do next. Before we do that, uh, let us uh, devise a calculation procedure that will allow things to be done in a very systematic and easy manner. That is what uh, we are going to do. <coughs> so, for this purpose, we start with our uh, the original governing equations that we uh, looked at. So, the uh, states uh, between inlet and outlet are related like this rho 1 u 1 equal to rho 2 u 2 and if you remember p 1 plus rho 1 u 1 square is equal to p 2 plus rho 2 u 2 square and the energy equation itself could be written like this T 0 2 minus T 0 1 is equal to Q over C p. And in addition to this, we also have the uh, definition of uh, Mach number u1 or u is equal to u is equal to the Mach number at any point times square root of gamma r t as the definition. And we also have the equation of state which says p equal to rho r t at any point. Using these uh, uh, using these relationships, we can actually uh, write down the following equations which connect the inlet and the outlet state in terms of Mach numbers alone. Okay. So, we can write for example, P 2 over P 1 is equal to 1 plus gamma M 1 square over 1 plus gamma M 2 square that is one relation. And uh, we can also write down since using the equation of state. P 2 is equal to rho 2 r T 2 and P 1 is equal to rho 1 r T 1 and in addition we use the fact that we can uh, we can actually uh, use the fact that rho 1 u 1 equal to rho 2 u 2 and we can combine these three equations and write T 2 over T 1 as 1 plus gamma M 1 square divided by 1 plus gamma M 2 square the whole squared times M 2 square over M 2 over M 1 whole square. So, we can write T 2 over T 1 also in terms of M 1 and M 2. So, this is very similar to what we did earlier in the normal shock uh, relations. right? So, if I, I know M 1, I know T 1, I know P 1, if I know M 2, then I can evaluate all the downstream states using this relationship. And further to this, we can also write for example, the ratio of stagnation quantities P 0 2 over P 0 1 can be written as P 0 2 over P 2 times P 2 over P 1 times P 1 over P 0 1. So, this we can simplify and write in terms of these uh, expressions as follows 1 plus gamma M 1 square divided by 1 plus gamma M 2 square the whole square times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times M 2 square divided by 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times M 1 square. The whole thing raised to the power gamma over gamma minus 1. And in the same way, we can write T 0 2 over T 0 1 like this is equal to T 0 2 over T 2 times T 2 over T 1 times T 1 over T 0 1. 
and once again I can write it like this 1 plus gamma m1 square divided by 1 plus gamma m2 square whole square times m2 over m1 square times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times m2 square divided by 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times m1 square. So now if I look at these expressions notice that T02 over T01 is known to me because we have specified Q for the problem remember the we are looking at uh, flow with heat addition in a duct. So the inlet uh, state is specified we have also specified the amount of heat that is being added right. So Q is known to me which means that Q is known to me so T01 is known to me so that means T02 is known which means that I can actually uh, calculate M2 from this. So in this expression so if I write it like this right T02 over T01 right. So if you look at this expression notice that Q is uh, specified in the problem T01 is also known so I can calculate T02 from this equation. So once I calculate T02 from this equation I can evaluate the left hand side and M1 of course is completely known. So we know M1. So this is an equation that I can solve for M2. It is a very complicated equation but hopefully it will have multiple solutions also but hopefully it is something that we can solve. So once I obtain M2 then I can calculate all the other quantities like P02 over P01 and T2 over T1, P2 over P1 and so on. All the other things can be calculated once I know M2 and I know how to calculate M2 also from this. So this is a viable solution procedure but made uh, difficult by the fact that this equation is a highly complicated equation. It will have multiple solutions and it may be very difficult to solve. A much easier way is to use a tabulated form of this equation. So what we do is the following. Let us say that we uh, take uh, we take M2 to be equal to 1. Right. So for a given value of M1 for any given value of M1 let M2 be equal to 1. So if I let M2 to be equal to 1 then this equation is simplified T02 then becomes equal to T0 star right. So then there is nothing for me to solve there is no equation to solve because I have let M2 equal to 1 I can directly evaluate T0 star I am not solving for T0 star I am evaluating T0 star from this I know T0 star from this I can calculate all the other uh, quantities also setting M2 equal to 1. Once I do this for a, a given value of uh, Q but, they, but we have not supplied Q star we have only supplied Q what this gives me is the final state if I had supplied Q star correct but the given value is only Q. So what I do is the following now I know my uh, T02 for the given value of Q So what I do is the following, I do this, I evaluate T0 star for different values of M1 and I tabulate the result. So I do this for M1 equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and so on and for each value I tabulate T0 star corresponding to that uh, value. Now I know Q, I know T01 which means I know T02, right. Now I know uh, T0 star also. So what I do is I now do a reverse lookup where I see for this value of T0 over T0 star what is the value for M from here okay do you understand the procedure. So it uses a tabulated procedure so we do not actually solve any equation at all from this. 
okay that is basically what we are doing so from uh, this table from this table we calculate t0 star right i know t02 so i know t02 over t0 star because the table uh, tabulates values of t02 over t0 star or t0 over t0 star so once i know this i can look up the value of m which corresponds to that value of t0 now i have my m2 right and then i can proceed with the calculation is that uh, procedure clear to you right so that is what we are uh, going to illustrate so uh, t02 is known since t0 star is also known the value of m that corresponds to the value of m1 for example uh, that corresponds to this value of t0 over t0 star or t02 over t0 star can be looked up from the table from the table so that is the calculation procedure for any given value of q and we are going to now demonstrate this with a worked example So the worked example states the following, air enters a combustion chamber at 69 meter per second, 300 Kelvin and 150 kilo Pascal, where 900 kilo joule per kilogram of heat is added. Determine A, the mass flow rate per unit ductaria, B, exit properties and C, inlet Mach number if the heat added is 1825 kilojoule per kilogram. Okay. So, let us uh, sketch the flow situation that we are looking at. So, we have a duct <coughs> so initially it is given that u1 is equal to 69 meter per second, t1 is equal to 300 Kelvin and P1 is equal to 150 kPa. Heat is now added here to the amount of 900 kilo joule per kilogram. So we are asked to determine the exit properties which would mean M2, P2, T2 and the stagnation quantities that is what we are asked to determine. And we will assume the following, we for air we take gamma to be 1.4 and the molecular weight of air to be 28.8 kilogram per kilo mole.
okay. So, we first determine the uh, Mach number m1. So, m1 is equal to u1 divided by a1. So, that is nothing but 69 divided by square root of gamma or t1. And if you substitute the values, remember r is equal to this r is the particular gas constant. So, this is equal to 8314 divided by 28.8 and this is in units of joule per kg Kelvin. So, if you plug in these uh, values for gamma r and t1, we get m1 to be equal to 0 0.2 and uh, t01 can be calculated. t01 is equal to t1 times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times m1 square and if you substitute the numbers, you get this to be 302 Kelvin and P01 is equal to P1 times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times M1 square raised to the power gamma over gamma minus 1 and this comes out to be 154 kilo Pascal. Now, we are first asked to calculate in A the mass flow rate per unit duct cross sectional area. So, m dot is going to be rho 1 u 1 times A and A is given to be 1 meter square and rho 1 is nothing but P 1 over R T 1. So, if you substitute the uh, values, you get this to be 0 0.12 times 10 to the 2 kilogram per second as the mass flow rate through the duct for these conditions. Hmm? Yeah, I have taken to be uh, 1 meter square, so I am writing this as kg per second. If you write a mass flow rate in terms of kg per meter square per second, that is extremely confusing. You know? So, with the understanding that A is 1 meter per second, we will write it as kg per second. Part B, we are asked to calculate the exit properties for a heat addition which is equal to 900 kilojoule per kilogram and we are going to use the tables for this, but before we do that, let us calculate uh, T02 first. So, T02 if you remember is equal to T01 plus Q over Cp and this is nothing but T01 plus Q, Cp is nothing but gamma r over gamma minus 1. So, if you substitute the numbers, you get uh, T02 to be 1138 Kelvin. Now, M1 is given to be 0.2. So, we use the table to determine T0 star corresponding to M1, right? T0 star over T0, that is what we are going to calculate. So, this is the table that we are going to use, table C, which gives Rayleigh flow properties for a fixed value of gamma. And we do for M1 equal to 0 0.2, you can see from here that M1 equal to 0 0.2 comes right here. So, all the values are given. So, we go to the last column and we pick up T0 over T0 star from there. Other quantities can also be picked up from here. Okay? So, we take the values from here T0 over T0 star. So, let us uh, write it down from the table for M1 equal to 0 0.2, we get T01 over T0 star to be approximately 0 0.1736 and P01 over P0 star to be 1.235. So, this allows me to calculate 
my T0 star to be 1740 Kelvin and my P0 star to be 125 kilo Pascal. Okay. As we stated earlier, now T02 is known, T02 over T0 star can be calculated to be 1138 divided by 1740, which comes out to be 0 0.6857. So, we now go to the tables corresponding to this value of T0 over T0 star, we try to retrieve what the Mach number is going to be, that is the calculation procedure. Okay? So, we actually do not solve any equation, we simply do a table lookup, which is very, very convenient to do. So, we go to the tables and for this value of uh, T0 over T0 star, if you go down the table. You can see that approximately this is 0 0.6857. So, we get approximately 6857 comes somewhere in between these two, right? Somewhere in between these two. So, we take the Mach number to be between 0 0.49 and 0 0.5. So, from the tables. For this value of T0 over T0 star, we get M2 to be, we will approximate it as 0 0.49. It actually falls in between 0 0.49 and 0 0.5. And I can also retrieve P02 divided by P0 star. I can retrieve this also in one go to be 1.118. P0 star is already known to me from here, right? P0 star is 125 kilo Pascal. So, I can now evaluate P02 from this. So, P02 is equal to 1.118 times 125 which is nothing but 140 kilo Pascal. So, you should remember that our P01 was calculated to be 154 kilo Pascal was P01 and notice that P02 is 140 kilo Pascal which means there is a loss of stagnation pressure due to the heat addition that is consistent with what we expect uh, from these calculations. So, we are asked to calculate uh, T2, the static state also. So, T2 I can calculate this way, T2 is equal to T02 divided by 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times M2 square and if I substitute the numbers, I get T2 to be 1138 Kelvin and P2 we calculate in a similar manner, P2 is equal to P02 divided by 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times M2 square raised to the power gamma over gamma minus 1. So, this comes out to be 119 kilo Pascal. Remember, this is a subsonic uh, flow. The Mach number is subsonic at the inlet. So, we expect heat addition. Uh, we expect the static pressure to decrease as a result of heat addition and that is what we are seeing here also. Yes? T2 is 11138. Uh, T0 2 is 1135. Did I make a mistake? T2 is 
So the reduction in static pressure as a result of heat addition is also consistent with our expectations. <coughs> now part C, uh, the heat instead of 900 kilojoule per kilogram, the heat addition is given to be 1453, right? So the, the given heat addition is, I am sorry, 1825 kilojoule per kilogram is the amount of heat that we are going to add in the same uh, duct. So, we are asked to determine the change inlet conditions for this much addition of heat. Okay? So, we need to first determine what Q star is. We need to see whether this is less than Q star or not. If it is less than Q star, then the inlet conditions will not change. There is no problem. If this is more than Q star, then there will be a change in the inlet condi conditions, usually a reduction in mass flow rate to accommodate this heat release. Okay? So, first we need to calculate Q star. Right. So, for the given inlet condition, for the given inlet condition, Q star can be calculated as Cp times T0 star minus T 0 1. Right? I know T 0 star. So, I can calculate Q star from this without any difficulty and this I get to be 1453 kilo joule per kilogram. Since the amount of heat to be added is more than Q star, greater than Q star, the mass flow rate has to decrease. So, we will calculate the new inlet uh, static condition to accommodate this value of heat. So, the uh, principle is that the mass flow rate has to be such that the amount of heat that I have to add which is 1825 kilo joule per kilogram will be equal to the Q star corresponding to the new inlet state. Right? So, that is what we are going to calculate. What is the new inlet state for which Q star is equal to 1825 kilo joule per kilogram? We are assuming the exit states to be sonic state. Right? So, assuming to be the sonic state, we need to find a new M1 for which this Q which is 1825 kilo joule per kilogram is equal to Q star. Right? That is what we are going to do next because no information is given about the exit state. We really cannot do anything. We simply assume it to be the sonic state. So, this means for the new inlet condition T0 star is equal to Q star over Cp plus T0 1 let us denote the new star with a prime because there is a new star, it's, we cannot use 1 anymore, we use prime. But remember the stagnation temperature for the new state is also the same, the stagnation conditions do not change. 
only the static conditions change. We argued that before. So, only the static condition is going to change. So, if you substitute the numbers T01 prime is equal to T01, right. So, if you substitute the numbers, you get this to be 2108 Kelvin. Hence, T01 prime divided by T0 star is equal to, remember T01 prime is equal to T01, so T0 star and this is equal to 0 0.1432. So, basically what we have done is we have substituted T01 was 302 Kelvin divided by the new T0 star is 2108. So, that is what we have done here 2108 to get 1432. So, with the value of uh, T0 over T0 star equal to 1432, we go to the tables to find out what value of Mach number this corresponds to. Okay? So, we go to the table. T0 over T0 star equal to 0 0.1432. So, T0 over T star equal to 0 0.1032. So, you can see that approximately I am getting M1 to be 0 0.18, correct? I am getting M1 to be approximately 0 0.18. So, from the tables, for this value of T01 prime over T0 star, we get M1 prime which is the Mach number, new Mach number at the inlet uh, to the duct to be 0 0.18. Okay? From this I can calculate all the other quantities, I know T01 prime, I know P01 prime, I can calculate T1 prime and P1 prime from this without any problem. Okay? Mass flow rate can also be evaluated to see how much lesser it is going to be. Okay? Any questions or doubts? So, this brings us to a close of uh, this chapter on uh, heat addition and Rayleigh flow. The next chapter is going to be flow with friction or fan of flow. Now, flow with friction uh, occurs in many real life applications, okay? especially compressible flow with friction. The kind of applications that we are looking at in, uh, in the context of this particular chapter would be 
<coughs> real life situations where, for example, you have a compressor that provides compressed air, which is located, let's say, outside a building. Normally, compressors provide air, which is stored in large compressed air tanks. Huge compressed air tanks will store this air, maybe at a pressure of 10 bar, 15 bar, something like that. And then the air is taken from the tank to the equipment which uses the air. The equipment itself will be located quite far away from the, uh, the storage tank. Right? So there may be an experimental setup or some other device which uses the compressed air. So these two are connected using pipes. When you do this, when you connect a high pressure air reservoir to an equipment using a pipe, you need to really understand flow with friction because many times um, you would have designed the equipment for a certain stagnation pressure and a certain mass flow rate, but unless you design the piping properly, you will not get that stagnation pressure or the mass flow rate. You may get the stagnation pressure, but you may not get the mass flow rate. So in order to design how to actually connect experimental setups to these types of reservoirs so that you get the proper inlet conditions that you want, you need to understand flow in pipes and ducts with friction, where frictional effect is present. And that is the main reason why we are studying this. In fact, there are many uh, places, for example, in the western countries where the compressor and the storage tanks will be located several kilometers away. They call that a compressor form. And so there are lots of compressors which supply huge amounts of air which is stored in tanks and then it is taken through pipe several kilometers long to experimental setups or wind tunnels and so on. So we really need to understand fan of flow so that we can design the uh, pipes properly and also the equipment, ensure that the equipment gets the air at the conditions that you desire. Okay? So that is the reason why we are looking at this particular application. So to simplify the scenario is almost the same as what we were looking at earlier. So we have a duct or a pipe, constant cross-sectional area and air enters, let us say inlet state is 1, air enters at inlet state 1 and air exits at state 2. Now you must remember that we said at the out, outset that the fluid that we are dealing with is a calorically perfect fluid. There are no viscous effects. Our momentum equations talked only about pressure and momentum. There are no terms related to viscosity. That is a very simple assumption which allows us to get nice solutions and we will still continue to do that. Okay? So we will still assume that there is no uh, viscosity and that the fluid is calorically perfect that is still okay. So what we are going to do is we actually take a look at the real life situation. So when you have flow through a pipe or a duct like this, the speeds are usually quite high. Remember we are looking at compressible flow subsonic, supersonic Mach numbers. So the speeds are quite high that the frictional effects, effects due to viscosity are confined to very thin regions near the walls of the pipe. Remember the wall of the pipe is stationary, right? fluid is moving with a certain velocity. So the wall exerts a frictional effect and that is felt only in very thin layers near the, uh, near the surface. So if I were to draw a velocity profile at this section, the velocity profile may look something like this. For the kind of flows that we are looking at, the velocity profile would look something like this. This is the velocity profile. So notice that the effect of uh, friction is confined to a very thin layer near the wall of the pipe. So what we are going to do is we are going to uh, treat this flow as if these layers are not present, but instead we would impose whatever shear stress this imposes, we would simply impose that. In the previous case, we said we are going to add so much heat. In the present case, we are going to say we are going to exert so much frictional force on the wall. Okay? So that the effect of these thin layers can be simulated without having the thin layers present at all. If you include the thin layers, that means the fluid is viscous. So we will not include the thin layers, but instead of doing this, what we are going to do is at the same section, we will assume the velocity profile to look something like this. Let me draw the uh, new situation. So the kind of problem that we are going to solve, we are looking at the same uh, duct and in the same section, we are going to do the following, we will assume the velocity profile to be like this. 
But now the drag force that the wall exerts on the fluid will be simulated by specifying a drag force on the wall. So this is an externally imposed drag force that we are applying on the wall. Okay? How we actually do this is not of any concern to us. As long as I know what drag force the wall exerts on the fluid, I can exert the same drag force here. Right? This is such a flow is called a fan of flow and this is what we are going to study. For a given inlet condition, pipe length and frictional force, I want to know what the exit state is. Static pressure, stagnation pressure, static temperature, stagnation temperature and so on. Okay? That is what we are going to do. So notice that we are still saying that the fluid, there is no viscosity and notice that there is no boundary layer. Right? So this thin layer is called the boundary layer. Notice that in the fan of flow that we are looking at, there is no boundary layer. Okay? The velocity profile is flat. But the effect of friction exerted by the walls is modeled by, using, by applying an external drag force on the fluid, okay? which is felt by the entire fluid, not just near the walls. That is the model that we are looking at. Such a flow is called a fan of flow. Okay? Now the governing equations for the flow look like this. Rho 1 u 1 is equal to rho 2 u 2, it is a constant cross section, so there is no change. And the momentum equation, remember now the momentum equation has to account for the shear force on the wall. Right. So we account for that like this. So we write P1 plus rho 1 u1 square is equal to P2 plus rho 2 u2 square plus so we assume the pipe to be of length L. So let me uh, sketch that also here. So we assume the pipe to be of length L and tau wall is the wall shear stress that is exerted on the pipe surface. So let us uh, write down all these quantities. So P is the wetted perimeter, A is the cross sectional area and tau wall. This is the externally applied wall shear stress. Remember, we are applying this stress externally. In the real case, this would automatically come out because of the viscosity of the fluid, but now we are modeling it and exerting this externally. Now, in um, uh, basic fluid mechanics, we define something called a Darcy friction factor. Basically, this Darcy friction factor is nothing but a dimensionless shear stress. Okay? It is a dimensionless shear stress. So, we take a shear stress which has units of Newton per meter square. Right? So, we non dimensionalize this this way. <coughs> So if I now use this relationship <coughs> in this equation, I can write this equation as P1 plus rho 1 u1 square is equal to P2 plus u2 square plus 4 over dh times integral 0 to L, 1 half rho u square times F times dx, where this quantity dh is known as the hydraulic diameter of the duct. And is defined as 4 times the cross sectional area divided by the wetted perimeter. 
okay. Now from the definition of f you can see that u varies from one point to another right. So f it appears that f is also going to vary along the length of the pipe. So u varies from inlet to outlet. It appears that f can also vary from inlet to outlet but in reality if you look at Moody's chart you will notice that for the kind of velocities and Reynolds numbers that we are talking about f is practically a constant. So we need not worry about f varying from inlet to outlet. So we usually assume f to be a the quantity f to be a constant and that is an extremely good engineering approximation okay. So that is the momentum equation let us write down the energy equation energy equation is h1 plus u1 square over 2 is equal to h2 plus u2 square over 2 there is no heat addition or work addition. So energy equation is the basic form without the q or any work addition terms <coughs> and one more equation which is entropy right s2 minus s1 is equal to cv natural log p2 over p1 plus cp natural log v2 over v1 and what do we expect s2 minus s1 to be no heat addition right but there is a friction force which means there is an irreversibility so we expect s2 to be greater than s1 okay. So what we will do in the next class is uh, adopt the strategy same as what we did earlier we will illustrate starting from the inlet we will illustrate the uh, subsequent states on a TS diagram connect them to look at the process curve and then we will proceed further just like what we did before in the next class. Mm -hmm.